Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for talking about it. So my portion is I'll be talking about the about the FTLMs, which are small group <coughs> sessions. Um, so my piece of this presentation is a little bit different because of course we're all talking about uh, these this curriculum from different angles. Um, the main the premise of this lies in the learning sciences principles, two uh, theories, one is the cognitive load theory and the other one is the dual processing theory. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit, no doctor ever gets up in the morning and says I'm just going to end somebody's life, but yet uh, we, <laughs> we do. That's sad, uh, it's, it's astonishing, it's really sad. Uh, our numbers have continued to rise, we make multiple errors and medical errors are now the third leading cause of death, which uh, to be fair, not is all because of us, but then we have a role to play. Um, so, and now of course focusing on, on the broad uh, reasons why errors happen, my focus is very minuscule, there is a medical crisis, there are 18 million diagnostic errors made, but then of course not all of them lead to bad outcomes. Uh, that is just to keep in mind because not every mistake leads to a poor outcome. Um, in, uh, there is some data that says one in 20 diagnoses are incorrect, uh, which is again something to reflect upon and say, okay, we gotta do something about it. Um, so my focus mainly is that a lot, whole lot of those errors are cognitive errors because we, because of multiple reasons, and not just because we are incompetent or, or not fully competent, but also because of the fuzzy presentations of patients. Patients never read the book. Uh, they, uh, and there are lots of things that go on uh, in, in clinical settings. So, so of course, we're not to be blamed for all of it, but there are lots of rooms for improvement here. And um, so just focusing on that in the preclinical setting, um, again, this is a very micro-focused area. I'm not talking about, I'm not making a claim that we are, uh, we are trying to improve everything when it comes to medical errors, but focusing in the preclinical area, you can see that uh, there are multiple ways where we can actually uh, fail in, in diagnostic reasoning. One uh, is right here. If you don't learn, if you don't learn the information, we never store the information <coughs> in our memory. And of course, we're never going to recall it, right? So that's the memory education. Uh, on the other hand, we can we can remember things, we can try to memorize, but then we uh, we don't bring it to our working memory. So it just kind of stays there in the in the closet somewhere hidden, and we never bring it to the front when we are actually performing or seeing patients. And then the third thing is we never put the two things together. We never say oh, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I had learned, and this is what it is. So we see this happen all the time. So basically it's recall problem, retrieval pr problem, and then it's the reasoning problem. So that's for, uh, and that is one of the reasons, like Dr. Fidipato alluded to, that one of the reasons why our students were not passing PE because they were um, making a lot of mistakes in data gathering, and that is partially tied into clinical reasoning. So, so our solution, or, or at least we're trying to accomplish this, is that we're saying that we can improve recall by focusing on the cognitive load theory, which basically, where we are using a scaffolding tool, because we, we can say, or we can make a claim that by scaffolding, we can improve retrieval of the information. Our students do a great job acquiring information and, and just kind of, um, storing it in their, in their hippocampus, but retrieval of that information is sometimes challenging. And the second thing is we are saying that we can use a cognitive strategy for improved reasoning. So these two things are what we are, uh, we apply in the clinical reasoning uh, small sessions. So what are those? So basically our scaffolding tool for improved recall is mind maps in the small group sessions and our cognitive strategy for improved reasoning is epilogical approach, which is an approach. I'm not saying that this is the only approach uh, that will be successful, but it is an approach. So uh, for those of you who like computers, you can think about it as in terms of hardware and software. So epilogical approach is the hardware, and the mind map for every patient presentation is the software. So you have to have both. You can't have 
one without the other to be able to be successful. So, in uh, and you can also think about it like if you are going to present somebody with uh, a smoothie, you can make, you know, I get up in the morning, I make a smoothie for my son. But if I don't have a blender, I can't make it. If I don't have the ingredients, I can't make it. So it's, this is your ingredients and this is your machine. Or you can say, all right, this is the road and this is the vehicle. So you can think about it in different terms. But basically, um, my claim is that you need to use both of these. You need a good cognitive strategy, but you also need a, a good organized uh, knowledge structure. So why are we using the mind map as a scaffolding tool? Because that is to reduce cognitive load. Um, students memorize a lot of material, but then uh, whenever we ask them questions, they're not able to often recall it if it's not organized. Um, and then, uh, and we all know about cognitive load. There is a huge amount of it. So in order to reduce the load so that we can retrieve information, we are using this tool. And uh, because of time, I will not talk about how we are making the mind map. Uh, can leave it for a different time. And this was for Didi. <laughs> because <laughs> I was going to give this to you so you can use it. So this is, we are saying, okay, don't be horrified by the amount of information that is presented and acquired in medical school. Uh, it can be so difficult, but we're going to try to help all of us here. So, all right. So when it comes to, so just a little bit kind of uh, twist on the, from the flow here. So when it comes to cognitive strategies, we all make mistakes. And and that is, uh, and in order to kind of get better at that, I'm focusing on the dual processing theory. And these are all kinds of biases. So there are effective biases and there are cognitive biases. And effective biases are, of course, um, things that we can improve on, but they are not necessarily, they don't, they cannot be really, um, we cannot focus on them very much in small groups. So we are focusing in the cognitive biases. And as everybody knows, there are more than 100 cognitive biases. Uh, we can't focus on everything, but we have anchor bias one that we are focusing on. Um, I'm not going to go into detail in all of, for all of these biases, but studies show that system one can, or, or at least the authors who have written about it, say that system one reasoning skills uh, or reasoning will lead to more and more cognitive biases and system two is to the rescue. So we are we are saying that using system two will help us reduce some of our biases. And so the cognitive strategy that we are using that basically leans on system two is the epilogical approach. And I think most of you already know what the epilogical approach is. It's a four-step approach. Again, like I said, it's not the only approach. It is an approach where we are um, we are directing students to use a four-step uh, process to get to the to the final diagnosis. So this is just a snapshot. But let me talk about uh, all of these in a little bit more detail. So step number one is that we we are asking students to build a list of differential diagnoses when they are presented with a patient presentation. So because again, studies show that people uh, make a lot of errors if they are not if not thinking about a diagnosis within the first few seconds of patient encounter. So if we don't think about a diagnosis, we're not going to ask questions. We're not going to ask questions. We're not going to rule it out. We're not going to examine the patient for that from that focus and we're not going to order tests. So, so therefore, it's always good to build a list of differentials in your head. Um, and then preferably build it in the order of epidemiology. So always look in the box before looking outside of it. Step number two is that you just make sure that your patient is not in an urgent or emergent situation. Of course, we want our patient to be alive so that we can finish our work. Right? So. Again, without recognize, if we don't recognize it, we'll be in trouble. Um, this is this, we are asking students to recognize it so they can uh, readily intervene uh, whenever they need to in preclinical setting. And step number three, this is the meat of the cognitive strategy. This is where the major bulk of it comes. Um, I think there's a little bit formatting problem here. But weighing is a step number three, where we are asking them to ask questions from the patient in a, in, um, in a very uh, methodical way. 
So not just kind of say, okay, there is a predetermined set of questions, for example, old cards, and I'm gonna ask that those questions and somehow I will get to the diagnosis. Not ask every single question about every diagnosis because of course that will make them very inefficient. But actually use a strategic method and that uh, basically relies on high yield questions and medium yield questions. So this method is just basically kind of uh, reflects a little bit more on uh, this mimics a little bit more a uh, 20 question game. So most of you know what 20 question game is, right? So we are saying to the students that you don't have so much time, just kind of first ask a high yield question that can divide your differentials into big categories. Then start asking focus follow up or medium yield questions. So you can get to the diagnosis fast. And then the last step is that we remove the anchor bias where we are saying that you make sure you're not overlooking any major diagnosis. So don't ask every question about every diagnosis, but at least ask one major question about every big diagnosis. So we are hoping that by using this strategy, we are, uh, we are able to improve uh, uh, diagnostic success, uh, which is basically arriving at the diagnosis accurately, efficiently, and logically. Because we believe in application-based curriculum, and because we also believe that information, transfer of information doesn't happen like this, and knowledge is always, is like paint, it's always useful when it is applied. So did I finish on time? <laughs> <laughs>